One of the other inequalities that you mentioned there with, yeah. with, I suppose, with IT progress and with social media is that you have these very few tech billionaires who have made a technological advance through some kind of piece of software or algorithm that has given them massive, massive wealth and they're not really being taxed fairly on it. And what the result of a lot of this is that people lose jobs because of the development of robotics or the development of IT in, in sort of other industries. And that you suggest in your book towards the end as you're giving these sort of ideas for the future that a fairer taxation on those sort of uh, leaps in technology would help to educate people about how to live and work in a robotic future, if you like, a, a world in which IT and robots will play far more important part in, in daily life. So, um, I, so I make sort of two, I think slightly different points, really. One is um, that we are living through an industrial revolution which is not unique, although it's different from more recent industrial revolutions, in the sense that it's an industrial revolution that is disproportionately rewarding a very small number of people who come up with, uh, who found these new tech, tech companies. And so, um, you know, you are getting these fortunes generated by, you know, the founder of a Google or an Uber or, you know, quite a lot of other companies, many of which will not be household names, but happen to have a position in a particular industry thanks to technological expertise. So there are fortunes being generated by individuals on a scale we've almost never seen. I mean, these are people who are, you know, as rich as pharaohs. And also when you accumulate that degree of wealth, you also accumulate an enormous amount of political influence and, and, and power. Mm. And they've come up with these products that, you know, many would say you know, enrich our lives, whether it's, you know, apps on smartphones or the smartphones themselves or all sorts of um, wonderful services that make our lives in many ways easier. But what's also interesting about many of these developments is in previous industrial revolutions, you saw quite a strongish link relatively, relatively quickly between technological change and the output of people, all of us, mm. in terms of our jobs, that was, you know, our productivity improved and, and the great thing about when productivity improves when output the output of people like us improves um, we can earn more mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's the sustainable route to paying people more money rising productivity now what's worrying about the current industrial revolution is it is widening the gap between rich and poor because of the, the way in which these astonishing fortunes are being accumulated by business founders but at the same time and this is troubling, it's actually not being reflected in increasing output of ordinary people. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, it's actually associated with a now longish period of stagnating wages and stagnating living standards. And actually, there's no sign at the moment of any of that getting much better. Now, again, it's a complicated picture because this stagnation of living standards isn't just to do with the nature of the technological advances we're going through. It's also to do with the way that the crash of 2008 smashed the, um, you know, you know, smashed the ability of banks to lend in an efficient way for quite a long period. Um, it's to do with the, the, the interesting decisions that British companies, particularly in Britain, you know, so let's be clear, this issue of productivity that is tailing off, that is lower than it was, gr growing at a lower rate, is not just a British phenomenon, mm -hmm. although it seems to be a worse problem in Britain than in much of the rest of the West. But there's a productivity problem more or less throughout the rich West. You know, it is a comp you know, the, the explanation for what's going on is complicated. Again, there are lots of drivers um, of this, and I say just at the risk of slightly overdoing the British side of all of this. Part of this is also to do with the, uh, the interesting decision by many companies to hire more people rather than investing in you know, expensive kit that would make their existing workers more productive. Um, but anyway, when you mix it all together, there is also something troubling and important about the way that this technological revolution is not seeking, or is not, sorry, is not at the moment anyway, actually making all of us better off in the way that previous industrial revolutions did. So that's one issue, and it's a hugely important issue. And, and, and it's also related to this other great fear at the moment, which is that we are getting these 
um, advances in robotics and in artificial intelligence that not only are not making us you know, richer if we've got jobs, they may ultimately mean that millions and millions of us are simply out of a job yeah. uh, because there are all sorts of, there are now all sorts of really quite good jobs that we thought only humans could do and that t now turns out the machines can do better and cheaper. So, you know, that's a huge challenge. Separate from all of that, there is this issue of how we get the kind of civilised society that, you know, we think we deserve, and mm -hmm. by that I really mean, in this case, the public services mm -hmm. we deserve, whether it's a health service, whether it's an education service, whether it's being looked after uh, as, you know, we get older and, in my case, much more decrepit. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a whole issue of, of um, what's known as social care. And there is absolutely no question that um, we're all of us going to have to pay more tax for the uh, kind of decent society we think we want and deserve. For years we lived in this fool's paradise that we thought that you know the whole cake would somehow get bigger and that none of us individually had to pay more tax. Mm. There's no question that the rich have to pay a lot more tax but I fear that most people, mm -hmm. not the very poor obviously, but most people will end up, if we want the public services we think we deserve, paying a bit more tax. So among the ideas um, that I explore in the book, you know, are, for example, a wealth tax. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, particularly if, like me, you think that the distribution of wealth between older people and younger people is chronically unfair, um, then you know it does make sense to tax the wealth of older people who've had it good for ages and have all the pensions and all the houses a little bit more. Now there are ways of doing that so people would say well you know what if you happen to own uh, an expensive house but you don't particularly have a lot of income, you don't have a good job, you know you're going to be forced to sell your house that's not very fair. Well actually y you can design wealth taxes in ways that wouldn't ever force somebody to sell their house. Mm. You could simply say, let's just say you levy a wealth tax of something like 2% of, of the value of somebody's wealth a year. It's completely uh, straightforward, frankly, to say, right, you, 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 you owe the 2%, mm -hmm. but you don't actually have to pay it. You could have a choice. You, you might actually say to somebody, you pay it when you die. Mm -hmm. it come, you know, it's effectively rolled up into a death duty when you die. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, th that would still be an enormous boon to government because if government knows that that money is coming, it can borrow at more or less zero interest rates on world markets against the security of that money coming through. So you can design these things in a way that are both fair in terms of raising money from people we, who have to pay for public services that we all need without actually causing you know, intense uh, pain on those, who, on, 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 on those who face the liability. But then there are other things I think we've got to be much more imaginative about. I mean, one of the reasons why we've got this widening gap between rich and poor is because governments in the West more or less abdicated responsibility for trying to restart the economy and basically said it's all down to central banks. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was central banks were, were broadly instructed cut the interest rates to zero, um, create lots of new money. They did that specifically to boost the value of assets so that people with assets got more confident, started spending again, started investing again. Um, but that in a way was profoundly unfair because the only people who have assets are the people who are rich anyway. And so it, cre it, it exacerbated the unfairness uh, of the economy, the widening gap in wealth between rich and poor, between old and young. So that was so. I do think we have to rethink, in a very basic way, how, for example, what's known as monetary policy works in, in that sense. So part of the part of the solution is that governments, as I say, have to be more active in taxing people who have those large asset gains. Because you know they don't have those large asset gains because they're brilliant. They have those large asset gains because they were lucky enough to be bought, born at the right kind of time when mm. house prices weren't ludicrously expensive as they are now. Mm. Um, uh, uh, but secondly, I also want to see more imagination in, in monetary policy. I mean, you know, one of the ideas um, that many people will regard as completely heretical in the book is that, the, you know, the Bank of England should have the capacity to channel 
funds at much lower interest rates in parts of the UK, mm -hmm. like the North East, um, which are, you know, have much greater economic problems than in places like London and the South East. Mm -hmm. it, sh it, should, it should be possible for, um, you, know, wh you know, whether you, I mean, there are, it, it, it's, it's actually not that complicated to, to, to design a system which would allow um, the Bank of England have a more decentralised structure and, as I say, to channel money at a much cheaper rate to parts of the country which badly need to borrow mm. at a much cheaper rate. Reading the book, I was very impressed with how up-to-date it was, given how quickly things change. We're, we're recording this interview at the very end of October. Yeah. By the time it goes out in November, my worry is that something else will have happened by the time we get to it. But you do finish off the book with these positive suggestions about things that we can do to take back control. And again, you finish off with, a, with another address to your father, yeah. which is about what you hope, you know, hope for the future. Are you hopeful? Are, are you optimistic about us taking this, what is, has been a big shock for a lot of people, and turning it into something positive? So anybody who's followed my career in journalism thinks I must be a very gloomy person <laughs> because I'm associated as a journalist. You know, I sort of, you know, back at the time of 2007 and 2008 crash, I was, you know, um, being criticised all the time for warning that this great financial crisis was coming and for warning that, you know, Northern Rock was in such terrible dire straits and other banks were in similar dire straits. And you know, a lot of people, you know, accused me of single-handedly trying to destroy, you know, the British economy. And it took quite a long time for people to recognise that I was simply delivering, an, you know, a message that people had to hear and I wasn't doing anything other than normal journalism. Um, uh, and, you know, it is striking that I've, you know, the last couple of years I've been immersed in politics as the world has become, in a political sense, a much more uncertain place. But fundamentally, I am a very, very optimistic person. I mean, what I, you know, I, I the reason that I have devoted my whole career to warning people about the rocks that are out there is because, you know, it's really important that all of us see the rocks ahead and take the evasive action that is necessary. I mean, you know, Britain is a fantastic, dynamic, you know, country full of absolutely brilliant people. You know, I'm a, you know, same is true of almost all the Western countries, European countries, America that I talk about in, in the book. We, you know, we have enormous resilience. Mm. We are incredibly wealthy countries. Um, you know, my own view is, yes, we can and will sort ourselves out, but we won't if we bury our heads in the sand about you know, the very real problems we face. Well, I, I mentioned at the top, there, there are three questions on the cover of the book. What have we done? Why did it happen? And, and how do we take back control? I do feel much clearer about the answer to all three of those questions Hooray! after the book <laughs> than I did before. Um, so, you know, it was great to read and, and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me a bit about it today. So, Pleasure. Uh, Lovely to be here. Thank you very much.